I have had requests from several of you now for me to work the hanging chain problem. This is commonly known in the mathematics world as the catenary problem, or as I'm told in some parts of the UK, the catenary problem. Allow me to translate from English to English. But all of that refers to the same problem, and that is what is the shape made by a hanging chain or hanging rope when hanging under the effects of gravity? Normally, I would have made a couple of videos prior to making this video, but since it has been requested, I'm going to go ahead and I'll just point out in those places where there might be a little bit of background missing and for which I can later provide a video. This is a problem that has been studied for a long, long time. And, you know, the idea is, what is the shape that a hanging chain makes? At first, it was thought to be a parabola, but as we're going to show, it's actually not a parabola. But until we demonstrate it, its shape's going to remain a mystery. So as always, we're going to start off with a point that we'll call A, located at a position x1, y1, and a second point B at x2, y2. And in this case, we've got a chain, so something with no flexural rigidity, hanging between the two points under the effects of gravity. This chain has a fixed length L, and let me add my gravity vector here. We're going to make a couple of assumptions. The first is that the density rho and the cross-sectional area A of the chain is constant, so that the mass per unit length is constant. And the second assumption is that the length is constant. Now, in order to solve this problem, we want to minimize the potential energy of the chain. We've referred to this in a previous problem. But we're looking for a path subject to the fixed length L that minimizes the potential energy of the chain. And that is the shape that nature will allow the chain to hang in. So in this case, our integral I is just the potential energy of the chain. So it's the integral from A to B of mg and the height, which is mgy ds. And m in this case is just rho times A. It's the mass per unit length that we're integrating the potential energy for each unit piece of mass along the length ds. And that gives us I, the potential energy in this case. The other thing that we see in this problem that we haven't addressed before is the idea of a constraint or a constraint equation. In this case, the constraint is simply the length of the chain. But how do we write the length of the chain? Well, we'll call this integral j, and j is equal to the integral of ds from a to b. So it's just the integral of the incremental path length, and that is equal to the length l. And now I've shown this in a couple of videos already, I'll just draw it very quickly, that this incremental path ds can be written in terms of dx and dy using Pythagoras' theorem. I can be rewritten as the integral from x1 to x2 of mgy and then substituting ds for root 1 plus y prime squared dx. And j similarly is the integral from x1 to x2 and instead of ds, root 1 plus y prime squared dx. And that is equal to L. So to be clear, we wish to minimize I subject to the constraint that J is equal to L. We haven't seen a minimization problem yet of this sort, where the minimization is subject to a constraint. It's not just that we're minimizing the potential energy, it's that we need to do it subject to this constraint. So up till now, we would simply take the variation of i and set that equal to zero. And that would give rise to the Euler-Lagrange equation. And we would substitute in our functional f. Instead, and in order to handle this constraint, I'm going to introduce you to something called the Lagrange multiplier. And normally, I would have made a video or two prior to this, because the topic of Lagrange multipliers is a pretty involved topic all on its own. Suffice to say, this Lagrange character was a really, really smart guy and really just saw the world very differently from everyone at the time. Mathematically, he showed how to handle this using something called a Lagrange multiplier, and this can be shown separately to be true. For now, you're just going to have to take my word for it. But at the time of the recording of this video and due to popular demand, I hadn't yet created the videos that would explain all of this. So if you are now watching this enough time into the future, and I have created that video explaining this, then there will be a link to it up above. Anyway, that said, so instead of our usual way of setting the variation of i equal to zero, we're now going to set the variation of i plus lambda times j equal to zero. And this lambda is something called a Lagrange multiplier. 
Now, to some of you, your heart is going to sink. And for some reason, the minute you see a lambda, everything gets confusing to you. This lambda is just a constant. Think of it as one additional unknown that we have introduced into the mix. So now, simply substituting the expressions for i and j into this, we can take the variation of the integral from x1 to x2 of mgy plus lambda times the square root of 1 plus y prime squared dx, and that is equal to 0. No great mystery here. I just took the definition of i and j, and I multiplied j by lambda. So if I take this and I multiply it by lambda, I get a lambda in front. Here I've got an mgy in front. And so here I've got an mgy plus lambda in front. Okay, and this just implies now that my functional is all of this. So I can write my functional f as a function of just y and y prime. And notice that f does not explicitly depend on x. Sure, y and y prime depend on x, but my functional doesn't explicitly contain an x. Let's number this 4 and 5. And then we know that in order to solve problems like this, we need to apply the Euler-Lagrange equation, which is partial f partial y minus d by dx of partial f partial y prime equals 0. Now, because in our case f doesn't explicitly depend on x, we can find a more simplified form of the Euler-Lagrange equation, and we do that by multiplying each term by y prime, so partial f partial y times y prime minus d by dx partial f partial y times y prime is equal to zero. Let's call this six and seven. And then and let me do this on the same page because I have everything else here, but uh, I'll do it in green just to keep it separate. The derivative of f with respect to x. So I want to take the derivative of this with respect to x and it doesn't explicitly depend on x. That is equal to partial f partial y times dy dx plus similarly partial f partial y prime times dy prime dx. I'm going to rewrite it in terms of this term. So taking that to the left hand side, partial f partial y times y prime, this I can just write as y prime, is equal to df dx minus minus this. And that is partial f partial y prime times y double prime for shorthand. We'll call that equation 8. Okay, now the idea is we can substitute this in for this term over here. And that's what we're going to do next. So this equation is just going to read that this minus this is equal to 0. We'll do that on the next page. Let's turn the page. And we need to substitute equation 8 into equation 7 derivative of f with respect to x minus partial f partial y prime times y double prime minus d by dx of partial f partial y prime times y prime is equal to zero. And then simply multiplying everything by minus one and rearranging the terms, I can rewrite it this way. Let's give them some numbers, nine and 10. And then just a little trick here, this is simply the expanded form of d by dx of y prime partial f partial y prime minus f. And this is equal to zero. However, by writing it in this form, we recognize that what we're taking the derivative of, that must simply be a constant. And therefore, y prime partial f partial y prime minus f is equal to a constant. And let's give these some numbers, 11 and 12. And now equation number 12 is a very useful identity. It's something known as the Beltrami identity. And it's sometimes written just as the negative of this, f minus y prime partial f partial y prime is equal to a constant, where this is just the negative of this constant, but it's still a constant. And just to clarify, the Beltrami identity is the form of the Euler-Lagrange equations. It's what the Euler-Lagrange equation reduces to when f does not explicitly depend on x, the independent variable. Okay, so anytime our functional f doesn't explicit on x, the starting point is using the Beltrami identity. And so that's what we're going to do here. Turning the page, let's copy equation 12. And then the functional f is just this. So let's copy that. That f is equal to mgy 
plus lambda times root 1 plus y prime squared, and we'll number that 13. And then we're required to substitute equation 13 into equation 12. And just plugging this in gives us y prime. And this math is a little bit tedious. I'm going to run through it kind of quickly. And for those of you who want to slow it down and go through it step by step, feel free. But substituting y prime and taking the derivative of f with respect to y prime can be written like this. Minus f, just plugging it in, is equal to constant. And then simplifying the first term gives us mgy plus lambda times y prime squared divided by the square root of 1 plus y prime squared minus the second term. mgy plus lambda root 1 plus y prime squared. And that's equal to a constant. This implies that, and if I put this over the same common denominator of root 1 plus y prime squared, that will reduce to minus mgy plus lambda divided by root 1 plus y prime squared is equal to a constant. I just saved you some algebra because I'm awesome. And this implies that I can just multiply by minus 1, and this still gives me a constant. I'll call this constant c1, which is just the negative of that constant. And let's give these some numbers. Are we up to 14, 15, and 16? And so we need to solve this equation to get rid of the derivative here. Turning the page, let me copy equation 16 over again. And I can rewrite equation 16 in terms of y prime as y prime is equal to, and y prime longhand, of course, is dy dx. That is equal to square root of mgy plus lambda divided by c1 squared minus 1. And then I can separate variables by bringing everything that depends on y here into the denominator and everything that depends on x here into the numerator. And that gives us that dx is equal to dy divided by all of this. Now I can integrate both sides. And let's just give these some numbers, 17 and 18. Now integrating the left-hand side is dead simple. That just gives us x plus a constant, c2 in this case. But integrating the right-hand side is a little more tricky. Any mathematicians up for the challenge? Well, fortunately, I can help you out because... I have a table of integrals. Check out the brains on Einstein over here. So substitute the following. Make the substitution that mgy plus lambda over c1 is equal to cosh, the hyperbolic cosine of eta. Then taking the derivative of both sides, really the differential in this case, mg over c1 dy is equal to cinch eta d eta. A reminder that the derivative of cosh eta is just sinh eta. There's no negative. We can rewrite this in terms of dy as dy equals c1 sinh eta divided by mg times d eta. Let's put a couple of intermediate boxes around these. And now we need to make these substitutions. We'll give them numbers 19 and 20. We need to substitute equations 19 and 20 into 18. And when we do that, the left-hand side simply is x plus c2, as we mentioned before. And that is equal to, just making the substitution, c1 divided by mg, the constants we can bring out, the integral of, of sinh eta divided by the square root of cosh squared eta minus 1, d eta. And for those of you who are on top of your trig identities, the hyperbolic cosine cosh squared eta minus 1 is just sinh squared eta, Square root of that would give you sinh eta. So this is just sinh eta over sinh eta, which is 1. So that substitution makes things really easy for us. x plus c2 is just c1 divided by mg times eta. And that is equation 21. So what do we need to do? We need to go back to equation 19. We need to take this expression for eta, which we can solve, and then substitute it back into this equation here. Let's do that on the next page. We start off by copying equation 21 again and equation 19. And, and equation 19 can readily be solved for eta. Eta is the inverse cosh of mgy plus lambda divided by c1. We'll call that equation 22. And then we need to substitute equation 22 into equation 21. And that gives us x plus c2 is equal to c1 divided by mg inverse cosh mgy plus lambda divided by c1. 
What I can do is bring these constants to the other side and take cosh of both sides and rewrite this as mgy plus lambda divided by c1 is equal to cosh of mg divided by c1 times x plus c2. And this can be rewritten as y equals c1 divided by mg cosh of mg divided by c1 times x plus c2 minus lambda divided by c1. And that's it, we're done. This is the solution to the minimization problem that we posed. And we'll call this equation 23. So what can we tell from equation 23? Well, first of all, what we can tell is the shape of the curve is a cosh function. It's a hyperbolic cosine function. It's not a parabola, it's a cosh function. The constants c1, c2, and lambda, yes, lambda is just a constant. And, and by the way, I find a lot of people just simply freeze up when they see a lambda. What is it? I don't know how to treat it. The lambda is just a constant. If instead of putting a lambda here, I cross this out and I call that constant C3, and I said to you, we had three unknowns, you'd say, oh, no problem. But for some reason, because it's a lambda, everyone freaks out. So the lambda is just a constant like C1 and C2. I don't call it C3 because it's, it's not a constant of integration as such. It's really a fictitious constant that we added as part of the Lagrange multiplier method, which is something not to be explained in this video, but in another one, and you're just taking my word for it for now. Equation 23 contains three unknowns, C1, C2, and lambda, and so we need three conditions to be able to solve for those. Our first two conditions come from our boundary conditions. These are at x equals x1, y is equal to y1. And similarly, at x equals x2, y equals y2. And this is because points A and B are known ahead of time. Put a box around this and number these 24 and 25. And so we have two equations for three unknowns. We need a third equation. Can anyone guess where the third equation comes from? It comes from the constraint equation. Remember, we haven't actually enforced anything to do with the length L yet, specifically. What we did here as part of the Lagrange multiplier method is we just took lambda times J. We didn't actually implement the length L yet. Okay, what do I mean by this? Let me show you. So the third equation is the constraint equation, and that, let me copy it again, x1 to x2 root 1 plus 1 prime squared dx is equal to L. That was equation 2 from way back at the beginning. And then from the previous page, I'm copying equation 23, which is the solution for y. And now we need to take the derivative of y so that we can use it in here. So taking the derivative, which is dy dx, we get c1 divided by mg, derivative of cosh is cinch, and we got to take the derivative of the inside now with respect to x, and that gives us an mg divided by c1. These two will cancel, so I can simplify this as y prime squared is cinch mg divided by c1 times x plus c2. And that's equation 26, and, and let's put an intermediate box around that one. Now, we need to substitute equation 26, the equation for y prime, back into equation 2 over here. Substituting 26 into equation 2 gives us the integral from x1 to x2 of the square root of 1 plus cinch mg over c1 times x plus c2. We've got to square that dx, and all of that is equal to L, and that's number 27. Okay, hope I'm not losing you. We're almost there, and then I'm going to review it all. Copying equation 27... And so we need to integrate this equation. We can make our life a little easier by using a trig substitution. That 1 plus cinch squared of x is equal to cosh squared of x. Since this is just cosh squared, and the square root of that gives us a cosh of mg divided by c1 times x plus c2 dx, that's equal to L. And integrating cosh just gives us cinch mg divided by c1 times x plus c2 and we need to multiply that by c1 divided by mg, and that's between the limits of x1 and x2, and all of that is equal to L. Substituting the limits gives us c1 divided by mg times cinch of mg divided by c1 x2 plus c2 minus cinch mg divided by c1 x1 plus c2. That's all equal to L, and this is our third condition. We'll number it number 28. Let's put a big red box around that. And for those of you who are looking at this and saying, well, yeah, that's a little bit tough to solve. 
clearly for just about anything other than the most simple case, and, and maybe even then, this is going to require a numerical solution. So this is the third equation, and notice it's just C1s and C2s. It doesn't contain any lambdas. And then these two equations, if you apply these conditions to equation 23, will give you three equations that can be solved numerically for the exact shape of the catenary. And that's all I really want to say about this problem. But before ending off, what I'd like to do is go back to the beginning and just run through it very quickly so that everyone is kind of up with the flow of it. I'm not so interested in the mathematics right now. I'm just interested in what it is that we did. So we started off with a hanging chain problem. We recognize that we want to minimize the potential energy. In this case, we have a constraint, which is that the length of the chain is a constant. Using the Lagrange multiplier method, we changed our integral from i to i plus lambda j, again, a method that will be explained in another video. And in that video, what we'll show is that this actually gives the exact same condition as what we've seen previously. Creating a new functional out of this, we ended up with this as our functional f. We notice that our functional is not an explicit function of x. And when our functional f does not explicitly depend on x, we've shown that the Lagrange equation reduces to the Beltrami identity. Using the Beltrami identity and our definition of our functional over here, our new definition according to Lagrange, we can now substitute that and then we get an equation that we solve. And when we solve that through some very smart substitutions, we get an equation with three unknowns, C1, C2, and lambda. And then in order to solve that equation for three unknowns, we need three conditions. Two conditions come from our two boundary conditions. And the third condition comes from our original constraint equation, which when you plug everything in, reduces to something like this. This equation can almost certainly not be solved in closed form, at least I've never seen it, and must be done numerically. And for those people who want to go down that rabbit hole, I've gone on and I've offered all of that. But Really, the meat and potatoes of this is this equation over here. This equation in mathematics is known as a catenary. Engineers don't have such cool names as catenary, so we call it the hanging chain problem or the hanging rope problem. But the idea is that a chain that is attached at both ends and hanging under the influence of gravity will form the shape of a hyperbolic cosine function. Well, I think that's all I want to say about this video. I certainly hope you found something useful in it. I know we went through the math kind of quickly, but it's all down there for those of you who want to go through it step by step and slow down the video. If you'd like to support the content in these videos, there are a few ways you can do that. The first is you can give us a like, and this goes a long way to getting this video in front of other people who might want to see it, people like you. The second is to hit on the subscribe button and click on the bell, and that way you'll be notified of any new videos as they're released. Or feel free to share this with your classmates if you think they might find it useful. If you have any questions or complaints or didn't feel like you got value for money out of this, I'd like to hear from you in the comment section below. Thank you for watching and I will catch up with you in the next video.